The era of Reconstruction to the rise of Jim Crow provides example of the three branches of government in action. After the Civil War, the United States government sought to integrate a free South into the United States. Although the war had not begun as a war to abolish slavery, it had transformed into just that by the end. Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation did much to alter the purpose of the war. The death, destruction, and loss sustained during the war led many to feel that the war should not be in vain. Consequently, the post-war Reconstruction period provided hope for a biracial, democratic society. The Freedmen's Bureau, pictured on the left, had a program to educate former slaves. Such ventures were short-lived, however. By the end of the century, white power in the South had been restored with the implementation of Jim Crow laws, which segregated and discriminated against African Americans. The term Jim Crow had originated before the Civil War. It had been the name of a racist character in a minstrel, pictured on the right. The character, Jim Crow, was a satire of a black slave played by a white man in blackface. The purpose was to make fun of black people. The term was a derogatory one. The black codes in the South that stripped black people of rights and made them legally unequal to white people came to be known as Jim Crow laws. Let's look at how the U.S. went from the hope of reconstruction to the rise of Jim Crow. The Radical Republican Congress, after the 1866 midterm elections, had enough political power to direct Reconstruction during what we call Congressional Reconstruction. They sought to make the ideals embedded in the American Revolution, and more specifically the Declaration of Independence, a constitutional reality. President Andrew Johnson disagreed with Congress's Reconstruction, but he was enabled to stop it because they had enough votes to override his vetoes. The House of Representatives also impeached Johnson in 1868. He remained in office, however, because the Senate failed to convict him. Note that the Senate did have the power to convict and remove him from office. Congress's impeachment power, in theory, provides a strong check on presidential power. That impeachment power also extends to federal judges. The founders had intended that Congress was the dominant branch but that all three were important to be able to check and balance one another to prevent one branch from becoming too powerful. By 1877, Congressional Reconstruction had ended. That, along with the 19th century Supreme Court decisions, paved the way for the Jim Crow era. We will focus on two of those decisions, the Civil Rights Cases of 1883 and the Plessy v. Ferguson in 1896. I should note that both decisions have been overturned and are now generally considered to have been, quote, wrongly decided, end quote. The post-Civil War amendments and Justice Harlan's dissents laid the foundation for the successes of the Brown v. Board of Education and Civil Rights Act of 1964. Harlan's dissent in Plessy v. Ferguson later became the basis for Thurgood Marshall's argument in support of Brown v. Board of Education. The successful Brown v. Board cases overturned Plessy, removing the legal backing to racial segregation. It would take more years for schools and public places to desegregate, but Brown removed the legal backing to segregation. The Civil Rights Act of 1964, pushed through Congress and signed into law by Democrat President Lyndon Johnson, was in a sense a revival of the 1875 law that had been overturned. The rights promised in the post-Civil War amendments, the second founding, were finally restored in a legal sense. The act meant that the federal government would act as a check on unequal local and state practices. Laws throughout the South continued to violate the Civil Rights Act as businesses denied black people services, accommodations, and access. When the civil rights cases, a group of five different cases that went to the Supreme Court over whether businesses could discriminate legally against black people, the Supreme Court in a majority opinion declared that they could, that the 14th Amendment did not apply in this case, and that the Civil Rights Act of 1875 was unconstitutional. The Civil Rights Act of 1875 was his last great effort toward the goal of racial equality. He drafted the bill in 1870, but had trouble getting the rest of his colleagues to pass it. As he was dying in 1874, he pleaded with Frederick Douglass and others, don't let the bill die. 
Sumner did not live to see the bill passed in 1875, but it was passed in his memory. The drawing here depicts a late senator laid to rest surrounded by African Americans with the representation of Frederick Douglass at the head. The image was to emphasize Sumner's passionate fight for racial equality. Many of his colleagues had tired of Sumner, who they found difficult. Still, in the wake of his death, they fulfilled his dream by passing the act. The Civil Rights Act of 1875 affirmed the equality of all persons in the enjoyment of transportation facilities, in hotels and inns, and in theaters and places of public amusement. Such places were privately owned, but had public functions, and therefore, according to law, were subject to public regulations. The act meant that the federal government would act as a check on unequal local and state practices. Laws throughout the South continued to violate the Civil Rights Act as businesses denied Black people services, accommodations, and access. In the 1883 Civil Rights case, the majority declared that the Civil Rights Act of 1875 was unconstitutional. It held that the 14th Amendment did not imply and did not allow for the creation of such a law. It claimed that the amendment had simply stated that no state shall deprive an individual of their rights. It did not say that a private business had to provide rights. John Marshall Harlan, pictured on the right, was the lone dissenter in the case. His dissent was based on the belief that Congress had broad powers as established by John Marshall in the early Republic, his namesake. He pointed to the public function that these private places of accommodation serve. Harlan argued that the line between the state and private action is often blurred, such as how private railroads provide government function of facilitating transportation and travel. See John Marshall Harlan's dissent below for his full argument in why he disagreed with the majority and considered the Civil Rights Act of 1875 constitutional. To review, the majority opinion of the court found the law unconstitutional because it claimed that the federal government did not have the ability to prohibit discriminatory behavior by private parties, including businesses, under the 14th Amendment. John Marshall Harlan was a lone dissenter, as he would be in the Plessy v. Ferguson case decided 13 years later. Harlan saw the 13th and 14th Amendments as giving Congress the power to regulate private places that had a public function. A more conservative reinterpretation of the case would be that the federal government can require the state governments to protect equality before the law and equal due process. In cases where the states have failed to do so, such as in the case of segregated theater, theaters or railway cars, the federal government could step in and require it because the state had failed to provide equality before the law and equal due process. Just over a decade later, the Supreme Court would hear another case involving racial segregation. This time it was the Plessy versus Ferguson case over a Louisiana law. Listen to the following summary by NBC Learn to find out about the background of the case and the Supreme Court's de decision in Plessy versus Ferguson. Again, Harlan provided the lone dissent in that case as well. Both have come to be seen as the quote, correct decisions. Harlan's dissent for Plessy is also available below this video in the lesson.